December 21, 1968, the countdown to one of the greatest moments in exploration began. The first manned lunar flight, Apollo 8, was scheduled to fly 230,000 miles out into space, orbit the moon 10 times, and return home. For the first time in history, humans were poised to head away from Earth and venture out to another world. It took a lot of guts, it took a lot of nerve to do Apollo 8. It really was a gutsy mission. The biggest thing about Apollo 8 that I was impressed with was that the country let us do it. It showed the real capability of this country, the real willingness of this country to do things which were forward-reaching and took some nerve to do. We knew that the Russians were hell-bent to do the same thing, and by golly, we were going to get there first. But I, I really didn't think they'd get them back. I just didn't see how they could. Everything, everything was for the first time, everything. While everyone knew the stakes were high, few realized the full level of risk NASA was assuming on Apollo 8. Even its flight operations director privately set the chance of a safe return at just 50%. Across the country, Americans watched in awe as Apollo 8 set out on man's first journey to the moon. It was all there in our emotions as they took off. It was a combination of concern for their safety and knowing that this was this great pioneering venture. We're all on pitch program. Roger. Mark, mark one, Charlie, Apollo 8. It was an event beyond all other events. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. In 1962, when President John F. Kennedy committed the United States to sending men to the moon before the end of the decade, NASA was already struggling to catch up with its counterpart in the Soviet Union. Encouraged by Kremlin leaders to create high-profile missions, the Soviets had awed the world time and again with their achievements in space. The first satellite, the first man in orbit, the first long-duration flight, the first dual capsule flights, the first woman in space, the first spacewalk. In the eyes of the world, for the mid-1960s, the Soviets were the leaders in space exploration. NASA wanted to beat the Russians. That's what this program was about, to show the world that the, the American system and the American way of doing things could do great things, and that was as much a public relations goal as an engineering goal. To move ahead of the Russians and land a man on the moon, NASA launched the ambitious Apollo program. But by 1968, after a series of technical setbacks, the program had slipped far behind schedule. With the Soviets pushing towards a lunar flight before the end of the year, NASA managers gambled on a daring move to put the Apollo program back on track. A risky mission to orbit and we have goal coming up on the five minute mark in the count. Six and a half years ago, John F. Kennedy set this nation on a course toward the moon. This morning, three Americans, Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, and William Anders, are on the verge of making man's first journey to the moon. Nine, we have ignition sequence start. The engines are on, four, three, Two, one, zero. We have commit. We have, we have liftoff. Liftoff at 
D1. This building is shaking under us. Our camera platform is shaking. But what a beautiful flight. Man, perhaps on the way to the moon. There is the staging. The, uh, the first stage cut off. These three brave men are the Columbuses of space, wrote the New York Times. The first of the human species to embark upon the exploration of our solar system. Eight minutes into the flight, Apollo 8 was traveling at a speed of 17,000 miles an hour and soon they were orbiting 115 miles above the Earth. How are you doing, Fido? We're good, Fido. Altitude is nominal at this time. Roger. The Apollo 8 crew, all former fighter pilots, was commanded by Air Force Colonel Frank Borman. A hard-nosed West Point graduate, Borman viewed his mission as a key battle in the Cold War. He was so focused on getting his crew home safely that he had fought to eliminate any risk he could, even arguing unsuccessfully against bringing a TV camera on board. Flying his first space mission, Bill Anders was a meticulous engineer who had trained as a lunar landing module pilot. But on Apollo 8, his main job would be surveying the lunar landscape for future landing sites while taking the first up-close photographs of the moon. Cast from a different mold than his crewmates, James Lovell Jr. was Apollo 8's command module pilot and navigator. Unusually easygoing in the precision-minded world of Apollo, Lovell's job would be to confirm the capsule's navigation and fire the rockets during all critical maneuvers. As Apollo 8 prepared to leave Earth orbit, Lovell had already spent more time in space than any other human uh, being. Yes, Apollo 8, are you reading on high gain? No, you loud and clear, Bill. How many? Two hours and 45 minutes into the flight, the crew prepared to fire their rocket again for translunar injection, TLI, the step that would catapult them out of Earth orbit and on their way 230,000 miles to the moon. Since 1961, when the Soviet Union flew the first manned flight, 34 Soviets and Americans had orbited the Earth, but no one had ever headed straight out. The farthest that any astronauts had ever gone from the surface of the Earth was 850 miles on one of the Gemini flights. That is about like looking at a peach and skimming the fuzz on the surface of a peach. We're talking about a much bigger step The engine on the third stage lights up, and they can feel themselves accelerating out of Earth orbit. And within minutes, they are farther from the Earth than anybody has ever been before. And they're going farther, and they're going faster. And on the computer readout, you can see the velocity galloping upwards. Right, Fido. No, altitude coming up now. Looking real good. They're getting up to 25,000 miles an hour, which is what it takes to get you out of the Earth's gravitational well and onto a path for the moon. As Apollo 8 embarked upon their six-day mission, they left behind a deeply troubled planet. Through 1968, America had suffered through one shock after another. The escalating war in Vietnam and the rise of anti-war protests at home. One, two, three, four, three, four, three, four, three, four. 
the assassinations of civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr. and presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy. Race riots in the cities and chaos at the Democratic National Convention. As troubles mounted in the outside world, NASA had been struggling for nearly two years with its own problems. In January 1967, before the first manned Apollo flight had even flown, a flash fire erupted in the Apollo 1 capsule, killing the crew during a routine drill. NASA immediately grounded manned flights for 18 months, as engineers furiously redesigned the Apollo capsule. The next five unmanned tests of the massive Saturn V rocket system, including flights that were called Apollo 4, 5, and 6, were hampered by technical problems that sent the rocket team back to the drawing board again and again. And by early 1968, it was apparent that construction of the lunar landing module was also hopelessly behind schedule. Apollo manager George Lowe spent several months trying to come up with some way to get the program back on track. Lowe knew that something drastic had to be done to preserve any realistic chance that an American would land on the moon before the end of the decade. Lowe very quietly reviewed the situation and came up with this brilliant idea to take the second Apollo flight and instead of sending it into Earth orbit with a lunar lander that wasn't going to be ready, send it to the moon without a lander. Just do the part that says we're gonna go from the Earth to the Moon, test out the communications, the navigation, all of those things that you're gonna to have to do anyway later on for a landing. You don't need the lunar module for that mission. We haven't flown humans on Saturn V, we haven't flown the redesigned capsule, but we're supposed to design, uh, decide now to fly humans on the first Saturn V in that capsule to the Moon. He said, can we do a lunar flyby? Can we fly out and go around the moon and come back? Do you think that's a possible thing to do? And my first reaction to that was, no, I don't think we can do it. To get all the control center ready, to get the network ready, to get the crews trained, to get ourselves, the flight control team trained, and to be confident that we know what we're doing, I think it would be a very difficult thing to do. I thought at first it was a pretty wild idea. But the more that I thought about it, uh, and we only had a couple of days really to assess it to, uh, uh, to see if we really could or not, uh, I uh, changed my mind and I thought it was a bold idea. And yes, we could. At that point, I said, yes, we want to give it a shot. But we have to tell you this. If we're going to do it, we want to go in orbit around the moon. We don't just want to fly around the moon. We're willing to try. We're willing to start working on these programs. We're willing to start shooting for that time period with building every, all these things we got to build. Lowe and Kraft had a tough time selling the plan to NASA's chief administrator, James Webb, who was still reeling from the Apollo 1 fire. Webb told his managers that their idea would put the whole program at risk. I'm sure he recognized that, that a failure in Apollo 8 would really be the end of the Apollo program, that the program couldn't uh, keep moving forward if there had been a second failure. The riskiest thing about Apollo 8 was the fact that they were not going to have the lunar lander along to serve as a lifeboat. The plan had always been that in case you have an engine problem on the command ship, that you'd have a whole other spacecraft there to get you out of trouble. You could use its engine to get home. But on Apollo 8, they were going to take that lifeboat option and throw it out the window. If these three men are stranded out there and die in lunar orbit, Webb told his deputies, no one, lovers, poets, no one, will ever look at the moon the same way again. But despite his objections, by the end of the deliberations with his staff, Webb wearily agreed to allow some exploration of Lowe's plan as a potential alternate mission. He said it was insane, Kraft and Lowe were told, but he didn't say, don't do it. The whole thing just clicked into place. It was like, it was like perhaps it had been out of focus if I had I'd thought about it, but the Apollo 8 decision was the gate opener, the gate opener to the landing. My husband came home and he 
as best he could, said what he had just volunteered for. And I was trying to absorb what he was telling me. And this is August. You haven't tested the capsule yet. December? That's what, three some odd months? But usually you train for a year. What? To the moon? For four months, the flight crew of Apollo 8 and their ground crew trained relentlessly. Working with a whole new mission plan and pushing to develop all the technical skills required by the new flight. It compressed everything that we were doing. It compressed building the software and the computers to go to the moon. It compressed measuring the instrumentation we had to look at the spacecraft when we were going to the moon. And we convinced ourselves, OK, we're now ready to go. But we think we can do the flight control. We think we can do the computers. We're satisfied the spacecraft's going to work. So let's get ready and go. While NASA pushed to get ready for Apollo 8, the Soviets were busy preparing for their own lunar mission. In mid-September, they sent a capsule looping around the moon, carrying turtles, mealworms, and a life-sized mannequin. Then in mid-November, Sand 6 carried another payload around the moon. Knowing that the Russians had a brief window to launch a lunar flight in early December, Americans sensed that the race to the moon was coming down to the wire. NASA's worst fears were realized when the CIA sent word in late November that a Soviet rocket capable of carrying two men was moving into launch position. Just a month before Apollo 8, it looked like the Soviets would outmaneuver the Americans once again. People in our country were convinced that we would be the first to land on the moon because they were used to the fact that we were always the first. The first, the first. What no one outside the Soviet leadership knew was that both unmanned Zon flights in the fall had problems during re-entry that would have killed a cosmonaut. In the upper reaches of the Soviet government, a heated debate was underway over whether or not to risk sending men on a December flight to the moon. We could have done it six months earlier. Two of the crews had passed all the tests and trials. Certainly, it was only the indecisiveness of our chief designer at the time, Vasily Pavlovich Mishin, that caused us to fall behind in this program. As NASA managers held their breath, the window for a Soviet launch came and went. Soviet leaders were ultimately unwilling to risk a crew without another test flight. While the Apollo 8 astronauts made final preparations for their flight at Cape Canaveral, the wives were left in Houston, caring for their families on their own. I would say they were probably gone six days out of every week. We had to fend for ourselves. I mean. Um, we didn't expect them to worry about us, and uh, I would say that we probably kept many things from the, of the family to ourselves. As much as I tried to hide my fears, even from myself, uh, uh, it was not easy on any of us. And it wasn't easy on our children, especially the older children, who understood what was happening. We'd say how proud we were, how confident we were, and then I'd go back in the house and kick a door in. I mean, I thought, they're rushing it, they're leapfrogging, they're too anxious to get it going. And I just sort of figured maybe you'd better face up to that and give it some thought and stop living in this cocoon. Because this time it's, it's not just another test flight. We thought we're in this, this is our life. We're military wives. We were not trained for this, but this is the kind of life we live. And there were other wives in other parts of our country at that time who were wives of people missing in action in Vietnam, who were wives of fighter pilots fighting in Vietnam. And that's what our role would have been had it not been this. As the training for the new mission progressed, Frank Borman was approached by Deke Slayton about his next flight. With all the changes in the flight schedule, 
it now looked as if Apollo 11 would be the first attempt at a lunar landing. In the typical crew rotation, that assignment would fall to Apollo 8's backups, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and either Fred Hayes or Mike Collins. In this case, though, Slayton wanted to give Apollo 11 to Borman with his crew intact. But without consulting Lovell and Anders, Borman cut off the discussion. For the sake of his family, he told Slayton, if he could get Apollo 8 home safely, it would be his last flight. Just weeks before liftoff, outgoing President Johnson asked the astronauts to leave Cape Canaveral to attend a gala dinner at the White House. The wives were flown from Houston to the White House, and all I remember is being extremely nervous because the Hong Kong flu was going around. And I don't remember anything about what happened in the East Room. There was some operetta or show put on, and all I heard was coughing and sneezing and thinking, this crew will be sick on the flight. They shouldn't be here. At the end of that program, we said goodbye to them in a room full of people. And he gave me some tapes that were to be played if something happened to him. And I think we were very aware when we said goodbye that, that this could be goodbye. Shortly after breaking out of Earth orbit on December 21st, the Apollo 8 crew jettisoned their last booster rocket and watched in awe as the Earth receded in the capsule window. I can see most of South America, all the way up through Central America, the Yucatan, and the peninsula of Florida. There is a big swirling motion just off the East Coast. And then going over towards the east, I can still see uh, West Africa. In Greece, that must be quite a view. Yeah, tell the people in Tierra del Fuego to put on their raincoats. Look like a storm is out there. So much rested uh, the hopes of America and the hopes of the world, perhaps, rested on the success of that mission. This was man escaping his environment, really out to the very moon itself, knowing that the moon would never look the same again, that uh, once man had been there and we'd known they'd been there and, and returned safely, everything was there. Uh, and it, it all was rested in that spaceship. 11 hours into the flight, with another two and a half days to go before they reached the moon, Frank Borman was the first scheduled for sleep. But before he turned in, the crew had one crucial maneuver to perform a short test of the only remaining engine, the Service Propulsion System, or SPS. At the moon, it would have to slow the command module enough to allow it to drop into lunar orbit. After orbiting the moon 10 times, the SPS would have to burn again to send the crew home. Initial readings showed that the SPS test looked good. For a couple of restless hours, Borman tossed and turned in a hammock below the seats, struggling with nausea. Then, after taking a sleeping pill, he became seriously ill with both vomiting and diarrhea. When doctors in Mission Control learned of Borman's condition, they immediately suspected a virus in the capsule. The doctors alerted the Apollo directors, and they slipped out of mission control for a private conference about whether to abort the mission. While they were absent, mission control was jolted by more bad news. Closer analysis of the SPS test showed a slight malfunction. We fired this engine, which was a confidence burn. It was intended to give us confidence that this engine, which we were counting on at the moon, was going to be all right. Lo and behold, the engine didn't behave properly. So we were sitting here looking at that stuck with, oh my God, is this engine not working right? Does this mean we cannot go all the way to the moon and put the vehicle in orbit? Do we have to turn around and come back? 
After 10 minutes of anxious debate, NASA engineers reported that the malfunction was likely temporary and they believed the engine would work properly when fired again to go into lunar orbit. Without enough fuel to test the engine again, 32-year-old flight director Glenn Lunny made the call to proceed on course. When Kraft and Lowe returned from their deliberations over Borman's illness, they accepted the decision on the SPS having made a similar call about the crew's health. By now, the commander was feeling a little better and the other astronauts were showing no signs of infection. Though off to a rocky start, the mission would continue as planned. Okay, we're rolling around to a uh, good view of the Earth. At 2 p.m. on December 22nd, the second day of the mission, networks interrupted Sunday programming for the first televised broadcast from Apollo 8. Hey, Apollo 8, we have a good picture. The moon is, is coming to you approximately halfway between the moon and the Earth. We've been uh, 31 hours, about 20 minutes into the flight. We have about uh, less than 40 hours left to go to the moon. You can see Bill's got his toothbrush here. He's been brushing his teeth regularly and demonstrating. The broadcast was supposed to provide an unprecedented view of the entire Earth, but lens problems made that impossible. Even without the Earth views, Americans were captivated as the drama of the crew's voyage began to sink in. Happy birthday, mother. Behind the good-natured banter was the reality that these three men were alone 100,000 miles out in space, moving farther and farther away every minute. So I'll be signing off here and uh, looking forward to seeing you all again uh, shortly. Goodbye from Apollo 8. At 2.30 in the afternoon, Houston time, on December 23rd, the third day of the mission, the crew of Apollo 8 crossed the gravitational divide. Now, instead of pulling away from the Earth, they were being pulled toward the moon. All right, mode one, five hours. Roll, one. Roger, the new attitude for the mode one, five hour and mode 15 minutes are... 12 and a half hours later, Tension filled the air as the astronauts prepared to fire the SPS engine. If all went well, it would slow the capsule just enough to safely enter lunar orbit. The crucial maneuver would take place on the far side of the moon, out of radio contact with the Earth. 50 seconds away from time of LOS now. Our distance away from the moon, uh, 460 nautical miles. The moon is moving a along in its orbit at thousands of miles an hour. It's 2,100 miles across. You're trying to zip ahead of the leading edge of the moon, whip around the back side, fire your engine, and go into orbit just 69 miles above the surface. You know, 69 miles out of 230,000 miles is not, doesn't leave you a lot of room for error. The backup crews and nearly every flight controller gathered in the control room. Current altitude away from the moon, uh, 377 nautical miles. At 3.59 a.m. Houston time, the spacecraft curved behind the moon. And then we had lost the signal as it went around behind the moon. And it was... Uh, rather depressing all of a sudden. It was a letdown, like, well, you know, what's going on? We don't know, we can't talk to him. And the first thing that I heard was from Glenn Lunning, who said, this is probably a good time for everybody to take a break. And I thought, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. How, how can we take a break <laughs> when the, the, the spacecraft and the guys are around on the, the dark side of the moon? And you say, well, there's not much we can do to help them now. <laughs> and we have a few minutes here, so it's a good time to take a break. If the burn went well, Apollo 8 would reappear in 36 minutes. If the SPS malfunctioned, the capsule could be sent hurtling into deep space or crashing to the lunar surface. These things seem to happen at night, always the middle of the night, Houston time. Wives had brought food over and we had 
you know, tea and coffee, and we were sitting around with the squawk box waiting for this thing to occur. My children were all upstairs asleep. I knew I had the full responsibility of them, and so I did worry. But I tried to not think beyond that because it was such a huge step for, for the U.S., for the world, for mankind. It really was. Ten minutes after losing communication with Earth, Jim Lovell fired the SPS engine. With the command module traveling backwards, the SPS burned for four minutes to slow the capsule into lunar orbit roughly 70 miles above the moon's surface. In mission control, everyone tried to remain calm as they watched the minutes tick away. As they were coming around behind the moon, I had set up two countdown clocks, one if the burn was not successful and one if it was. And then, when we heard from the crew within a second of the time that we expected to for a nominal burn, it was one of the, the, the happiest moments of my life. We'd been working for uh, six or seven years to accomplish this, and uh, there we were. We were in lunar orbit. The SPS had fired perfectly. It was 4 a.m. on December 24, 1968, and for the first time, human eyes looked down on the far side of the moon. Everybody sort of saw it at once, and suddenly here we were, knew we were on the back of the moon. Now we could look down. First time we saw the moon was this dramatic, a uh, high contrast lunar surface. We are like like three school kids looking into a candy store window. Yeah, I think we forgot the flight plan. We had our noses pressed against the glass. We were looking at those craters go by, you know, and it was a really amazing sight, really amazing sight. Apollo 8 would orbit the moon 10 times over the next 20 hours. While the ground crew tracked the gravitational influences on their spacecraft, the astronauts were busy surveying for future landing sites. But then their focus changed. After traveling nearly a quarter million miles to explore the moon, the astronauts unexpectedly found themselves gazing back at the Earth, captivated by their own home planet. The moon was a uh, terribly distraught landscape. It was uh, the most awe-inspiring moment of the flight when we looked up and there coming over the lunar horizon was the Earth. It was the only object in the universe that had any color to it, basically blue with white clouds, and uh, everything that we held dear was back there. It was a long way away. Oh, my God, look at that picture over there. Wow, is that pretty. Anders clicked off a black and white shot, and then Lovell gave him the color roll. He slapped that on the back of the Hasselblad camera, and he took the picture that became probably the most famous picture of the decade, if not one of the most famous of the century, of the Earth rising beyond the moon. That is still the picture that really sums up the electrifying experience of that flight, that here were human beings who had taken a monumental step away from home. And Anders came to the realization, even during the flight, you know, my God, we've come all this way to study the moon, and it's really the sight of the Earth that has had the most impact. It's almost as if we're discovering the Earth for the first time. That blue disk out there in space, floating alone in the darkness, the utter black of space, it reflected the brilliance of life itself uh, on, on our planet, and, uh, and what to mind all of the all of the 
wonders of our life here and also said to us, how is it possible for humans to live on this incredible island and, and live in enmity instead of a, an understanding of the brotherhood of all of us there alone together in the universe? It was a powerful moment. As the Apollo 8 crew looked homeward, around the world, millions of people were united by the same impulse, stopping for a few moments to stare skyward at the distant moon. It was Christmas Eve. I got in the car, and I was driving home, and um, there was the moon. It was just absolutely beautiful. I looked at them, oh my Lord, they're, they're there. I mean, it was, you know, to look up at the moon and say, my husband is going around that moon at this moment. As the command module moved through its ninth revolution, the largest audience in history tuned in for a special television broadcast. For 20 minutes, the astronauts cataloged the mountains and craters they were passing over. Then, as they approached the moon's dark side, they began to read a passage they had selected from the Bible's book of Genesis, the creation story. The thing about Apollo that sets it apart from every other event in the history of exploration is that human beings could share in the event as it was happening. We felt the awe and the wonder that these three men were experiencing so far from their home planet. Look at the step we were taking. And in that moment, they were touching base with the most fundamental narrative we have, the creation story. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called these seas. And God saw that it was good. I've never seen this place so quiet. It was a, a big hush in here and uh, to tears and a lot of eyes. It was just the perfect thing to do at the perfect time. And from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. Well, quite a finish for this last transmission from the moon, Apollo 8. From their television cameras there, 230,000 miles from Earth, some 70 miles above the surface of the moon. Chris came by one night. I said, hey, Chris, you know, I'd really appreciate it if you'd level with me. I really, really want to know what you think their chances are of getting, getting home. I really want to know. 
So he sat there with me and he pondered and he said, you really mean that, don't you? And I said, yes, and you know I do. I really want to know. And he said, okay, how's 50-50? I said, good. That suits me fine. After four days in space and 19 hours orbiting the moon, the astronauts were exhausted and ready to head home. With the capsule facing forward, they would fire the SPS engine again on the moon's far side to gain enough speed to break out of lunar orbit. Just minutes now from the most critical maneuver that Frank Borman, uh, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders have yet to perform on this historic flight of Apollo 8. Within, this uh, was just, it. This was the one that had to go. Firing their SPS this had to work or we'd lost those astronauts and the Apollo 8 mission. We knew that they had to get this burn to get out of orbit, otherwise they'd still be there. So it was tense, and, and it was one of the more critical steps, and, and uh, we, we knew the consequences. Shortly before midnight, Apollo 8 curved around to the far side of the moon, losing contact with Earth for the last time. We lost the signal exactly at the right time when they went behind the moon, and everybody at that point got up, started walking around in the room, and I got on my intercom and said, look, you guys do what you want to do, but I'm going to sit here, and I want to pray a little bit, and I'd like to have a little quiet here, because this is one hell of a tense moment for me and for those guys in that spacecraft, so for God's sake, be quiet for me. Apollo 8. And there was just dead silence. I mean, you really could have heard a pin drop. No one was breathing. No one was moving and uh, waiting to hear something because all you heard was mission control saying Apollo 8. You know, they were, it was a one-way transmission. Apollo 8, Apollo 8, nothing, 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 nothing. Jim, bless his heart, please be advised there is a Santa Claus. I, I don't know. It worked. It would take two more days in space, but the Apollo 8 astronauts were on their way home. Relaxed and confident, they began to enjoy the ride opening a few Christmas presents and catching up on much needed sleep. It was Christmas Day and uh, one of the things we had, we had uh, Christmas dinner. We had that wet pack meal of turkey and, and gravy that Frank didn't want to have on it originally but now he thought that was a pretty good idea and we all had a turkey dinner. Deke Slayton had secretly put in one of the compartments where we had our food three little bottles of brandy. Uh, the, uh, they were the airplane type brandies, you know, the little tent, uh, I guess, brandy. Uh, and as a welcome back, of course, you know, Frank was about to let us drink it. I think when you go out on the edge, like we did, sometimes the rewards are things that you never even anticipate. This was the one time when I saw that everybody in the world seemed to admire what we had done and that it was for a peaceful purpose. It was a Cold War act, but it wasn't an aggressive act. 
You know, Apollo was an adventure that wasn't just on the scale of a nation trying to do something great, but really all of humanity trying to take a giant leap forward. The impact of seeing the Earth as a planet, as a very small, very distant, and apparently to the astronauts, fragile looking ball in the blackness of space. That is a moment that ranks up there with any in the human species. On December 26, the crew gave one last broadcast before re-entry. Head for astronauts Borman, Lovell, and Anders is the fastest and the hottest re-entry uh, that man has yet made into the Earth's atmosphere in this age of space flight. Oh, here we go. When Apollo 8 began its re-entry, they were traveling at 25,000 miles per hour. The space trap started to rumble, and it was the first uh, fire coming off of the heat shield, and we now could detect the G-forces. And uh, pretty soon it looked like we were inside a blowtorch. 105 G, switch on. OK, we got it. EMS Hang on. All the Gs. We're watching. In the command module, after a week of weightlessness, the astronauts could feel the gravitational forces building. Oh. OK. Five. We would dig into the atmosphere. Six until it sustained the maximum amount of Gs and, and thermal load that the spacecraft was designed to take. Then we'd start out again. Then we'd roll over 180 degrees and start back down. In the Pacific Ocean, 900 miles southwest of Hawaii, the crew of the USS Yorktown prepared for the recovery. Ken Mattingly just put in a call and just frankly labeled it a radio check. He's gotten no responses yet. In the pre-dawn darkness, it would be impossible for TV cameras to pick up the descending spacecraft. But TV correspondents were there reporting to an anxious public. In mission control, the flight team watched silently as they waited for word that the chutes had opened. In their homes nearby, the astronauts' families also waited. At 4.51 a.m. local time, Apollo 8 splashed down in the dark Pacific. I can remember hanging from my straps with all the trash that had been collected on the floor, thinking, you know, here we are, heroic lunar explorers, you know, hanging upside down in the ocean with all this dirt falling in our faces. It was wonderful. I mean, I was sick as a dog from seasick, but we were lying there reflecting on the fact that everything had worked and we'd done our job well. It was. Uh, it was great. In Houston and around the country, 
there was a sense of relief and celebration, unlike any mission before. Just to see them being taken out of the space capsule onto the ship, it was just, it was wonderful. I mean, I just, I still remember how exciting it was to, to see these men knowing where they've been and what they've done and how the country reacted. Uh, I, I don't think it impacted on me until they came back. I, I was just so shocked that they really were heroes, so to speak, and I never thought of it that way to start with, but they really were. Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders were hailed throughout the world for their heroic feat. They were given ticker tape parades in New York, Houston, and Chicago. Named Men of the Year by Time magazine, and honored before a joint session of Congress. Even the Russian state newspaper published an editorial praising their infinite human courage and daring. But for Frank Borman, the most memorable accolade came from a stranger who sent a four-word telegram. Thanks, it read. You saved 1968. We did it. We overcame the obstacles. We overcame the fire, the problems with the lunar module, uh, the, the problems with the Saturn V that we had, and we did get people around the moon before the Soviets. We knew that this was the beginning of a grand new adventure. It was a moment at which people put aside the trauma of that year and their own day-to-day -day concerns and were just taken out of themselves as only this kind of an enterprise can do to let you see beyond yourself. That was the real legacy of Apollo. And the real impact of Apollo 8 was that we had a perspective that was a mountaintop experience for the entire human race. And from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth.